Hello and uh, welcome to the second lecture of the sixth module. Uh, we have been uh, discussing micromechanics of lamina and in our last few lectures, we actually uh, discussed how to obtain the uh, elastic moduli as well as the strength parameters of uh, fiber composites in terms of uh, the, uh, the, the properties of the constituent uh, fiber and the matrix. Uh, we also understood that there are different approaches for determination of this elastic moduli as well as uh, the strength parameters. Uh, and we discussed in details the mechanics of material approach for determination of the elastic moduli strength parameters. And in our last class, we have also discussed the determination of uh, hydrothermal parameters for a, uh, uh, a lamina in terms of the those of the fiber and the matrix. In today's lecture, uh, we will see in brief the elasticity approach, especially uh, to explain the, the tensile longitudinal tensile strength as well as longitudinal compression strength of, uh, of a lamina and we will try to uh, discuss in details uh, using elasticity approach the role of matrix in those two uh, uh, in, in longitudinal strength of lamina in particular. Okay. So, it is observed that uh, the when we determine the longitudinal tensile strength of a lamina. Uh, you will see that the tensile strength of the fiber is far higher, it is of the order of around 6500 mega Pascal compared to that of the matrix. Okay. I mean this is the tensile strength of the fiber and the tensile strength of the matrix is somewhere of the order of 200 mega Pascal. So, you could clearly see that the matrix strength is insignificant in determination of the strength of the fiber. Even if we consider say 50 percent volume fraction of fibers, so uh, apparently you can see that the matrix strength is insignificant in, in determination of the strength of the uh, uh, lamina. Uh, however, it was observed that uh, the strength of fibers impregnated into matrix is almost twice that of the dry fibers. What does it mean? Suppose we take only a dry bundle of fibers. Okay? say millions of fibers are there, a dry bundle of fibers, there is no matrix. And then we try to find out what is its tensile strength. Okay. What is its tensile strength? Okay. And then the same uh, bunch of fibers are actually impregnated to matrix and then their strengths are measured. It is observed that the fibers impregnated into matrix shows higher strength compared to that of the dry bundle of fibers. This is only fiber, this is fiber plus matrix and the strength is more, it is almost twice. So, why does it happen? Uh, the reason was attributed to the statistical distribution of fiber strength. Okay? That means, in our uh, all these uh, uh, mechanics of material approach, uh, uh, we have assumed that the fibers are of, if you remember the assumptions were that fibers are of uh, uniform shape, uniform size and uniform strength, uniform moduli, but actually the strengths are statistically distributed. Okay? As a result of that, what happens that the, it is unlikely that all the fibers will fail at the same time. Suppose the weakest fiber actually breaks earlier and then Suppose what happens is, suppose we consider just for the sake of understanding, suppose we have say, say three fibers okay, and say together they are carrying a load P, say tensile load P. Okay. Naturally, uh, there, uh, the fibers will be carrying p by 3, p by 3, p by 3, they are equally sharing the loads. But suppose one of the fibers is actually weak and say it breaks. Suppose this particular fiber breaks. Okay. Then if it breaks, it can no longer take part in the load bearing and therefore, the load is shared by the remaining two fibers and naturally the remaining two adjacent fibers are now, uh, I mean uh, uh, are now overloaded. Earlier they were carrying p by 3. Now, in absence of one of the fiber in, in the load bearing, they will be carrying p by 2 and p by 2. So, the adjacent fibers are overloaded. Therefore, the chance of 
the adjacent fiber breaking becomes more. Okay? So, this is called cumulative fiber breakage. The weakest fiber breaks thereby overloading the adjacent uh, fibers. So, the, so, another fiber breaks therefore, uh, again overloading the remaining fibers. So, this is called cumulative fiber breakage and because of that even though say the strength of the fiber is estimated to be 6500 mega Pascal it is observed that a dry bundle of fiber actually fails at a stress much lower than that. Now, what happens is uh, we have all this uh, we have understood that uh, that the role of the matrix is to act as a binder, but in addition to that actually the matrix also transfers load among fibers. You can understand that suppose this is one fiber and suppose this fiber breaks the adjacent this is the broken fiber. Now, if it breaks if there is no matrix it cannot take part in loading, but suppose they are bonded okay, by this matrix. So, what happens is the load from the fiber is transferred broken fiber is transferred to the, uh, the nearest adjacent fiber and vice versa. Therefore, even though the fiber a particular fiber breaks it is not that it becomes entirely ineffective a part of it still, still actually uh, might uh, uh, take part in load bearing and thereby increasing the uh, overall strength of the, of the uh, fiber matrix lamina. So, that is how it is actually explained and using the, uh, so that is what it is ca called that it reduces the ineffective length. In absence of matrix the fiber is completely ineffective, but when the matrix is there only a part of the length is length becomes ineffective in terms of not uh, participating in the load bearing and a uh, other part actually takes part in the load bearing thereby increasing the overall strength of the lamina. So, this is explained by means of a uh, model called shear leg model. Uh, in shear leg model actually the fibers are assumed to be axially loaded and shear is transmitted from the fiber to the matrix. Okay. Uh, in shear leg model we consider the fibers are idealized as simple axial rod. Suppose this is a fiber, suppose this is this another fiber which is say broken. I am just exerting here, it will not be that much break and say it is another fiber, intact fiber. Okay. So, these fibers are idealized as simple axial rod under tension uh, with shear transmitted by the matrix. So, this is the in between there is matrix. Okay. Suppose we fix our coordinate system like this. So, this is x, this is say y. Okay. Uh, suppose uh, they are together they are actually experiencing an axial tensile load. Okay. So, since this fiber breaks, so therefore, the displacement of this fiber we considered as u f okay, and so, suppose the displacement of the adjacent intact fiber is u. Okay. I mean we are only considering x component of displacement when we say displacement u, u f these are the x component of displacements. Okay. Now, if you consider a small length of the fiber, if you consider a small length of the fiber and use equilibrium, I am just exerting suppose this is a small length of the fiber, okay. say the length is d x. Okay. Therefore, this is experiencing because of the tensile load this is experiencing a stress sigma x at a distance d x this is sigma x plus del sigma x del x into d x okay. and say it is experiencing a shear st stress tau m okay. because there is a difference in the tensile stress at the two ends therefore, there will be a shear stress at the periphery. Okay, and here it is actually support uh, surrounded by matrix. Okay. 
So, considering a small length, now if we write the uh, equilibrium along x, so we, we write the force. So, this is the stress, this stress acting over an area A f. Suppose the radius of the fiber is R f, R f is the radius of fiber. Okay. So, therefore, A f is nothing but cross sectional area is pi R f square. Therefore, the force along x is this is x is this stress into A f and in the opposite direction it is sigma x. Say so this is uh, we write this as broken fiber. So, sigma f okay. sigma f del sigma f del x dx. Okay. So, in the opposite direction is, is sigma f into A f minus the shear strain, shear stress tau f acting over an area A p. So, what is A p? A p is nothing but the entire periphery that is twice pi r f into d x. This is the fiber is circular. Therefore, the circumference twice pi r f into this length d x. Okay. So, once we simplify this, we get this equation. Okay. So, finally, we get that del sigma f del x minus tau m 2 by r f is equal to 0. This is the equation we get where r f is the radius of the fiber. Okay. Now, we make certain assumptions. The assumption is that it is one dimensional stress strain. Okay. That means, we can write one dimensional means sigma is equal to E into epsilon. Okay. And of course, it obeys Hooke's law that means linearly elastic the same thing this is this comes from Hooke's law only and uniform displacement field in the surrounding given by u is equal to epsilon naught into x that I have already shown in the last figure and away from the break it is constant strain okay? epsilon x equal to epsilon naught. Now, the average shear strain in the matrix suppose you have we show that this is the intact fiber. and say this is the broken fiber this is the matrix suppose the distance is h this distance is h say the displacement of this intact fiber is u as i have already shown that and that of the broken fiber is uf Therefore, the shear strain by the definition of shear strain, it is the tangent of that angle. Therefore, this is nothing but u f minus u and this is h. Therefore, the shear strain gamma in the matrix m is equal to u f minus u by h. Okay? So, this is the shear strain where u is the far field displacement that, that means of the adjacent fiber and u f is the displacement of the broken fiber, h is the spacing between the fibers. Okay. So, with these assumptions uh, we can now write equation number 1 that uh, equation number 1 what was equation number 1 you can see that del sigma f del x is equal to 2 by r f into tau m. So, instead of sigma f we write E f into epsilon f. Okay. This is from the one dimensional stress strain relationships and Hooke's law okay. and instead of tau m we write gamma m into g m again it is the uh, Hooke's law. Okay. So, we can write sigma f is equal to E f into epsilon f in 1 and shear stress tau m is equal to gamma m into g m, g m is the shear modulus. Okay. Again we use the strain displacement relationship in elasticity, see this is an elasticity sol solution. Okay. What is the strain displacement relationship? We know that 
epsilon x is equal to del u del x therefore, uh, del u f del x is nothing but epsilon f which is the stress in the fiber in the x direction okay? and already we have the expression for gamma gamma m is equal to u f minus by the definition of shear strain. So, we put this in this equation and we obtain a relationship this del square u f del x square minus 2 u f minus u divided by h e f r f into g m is equal to 0 and therefore, uh, we can now write this equation in this form equation 4 where beta square is defined as twice g m h e f r f. Okay? So, from this we, we can write this in this form this is actually a standard second order differential equation okay? like uh, all of you know this second order m x double dot plus k x equal to uh, f. So, this is what it is. So, and we know the standard solution for this kind of equation is uh, for this equation the standard solution of this equation is u f is equal to c 1 e to the power minus beta x c 2 e to the power beta x plus epsilon naught x actually it has got two parts one is the uh, uh, the for the homogeneous solution which is the complementary part and for the particular solution which is given by this this is the particular solution and this is the complementary solution. So, together this is a general solution of this equation. Okay. So, what we obtain here is that the displacement field in the broken fiber is actually written in terms of the distance x and c 1 c 2 are nothing but the constants which could be determined from the boundary condition. Okay. Uh, so, let us see what are the boundary conditions. Now, we will appreciate here that in this solution this phi as x increases this term c 2 e to the power beta x epsilon increasing therefore, at a large value of x this goes to infinite. Okay? That means, if we x is very large the displacement will be infinite which is not possible, okay? uh, which is not possible that means, in order to avoid that the displacement has to be finite. Okay? In order to uh, avoid infinite so, uh, solution of the displacement then c 2 must be equal to 0 otherwise we get a solution which is not feasible. Therefore, we get the u f is equal to c 1 e to the power minus beta x plus epsilon naught x. Now, therefore, again using this uh, strain displacement relationship we have that epsilon f is equal to del u f del x because it is one dimensional stress strain. So, whenever we are talking about epsilon it is actually strain along x. Okay. So, we get this taking the first differentiation with x again using the stress strain relationship sigma f is nothing but epsilon f e f. So, we get the stress in the broken fiber okay, in terms of x. Now, you can see this equation 6 is nothing but the expression for stress in the broken fiber in terms of as a function of x. Okay. Now, what are the boundary conditions? We have to find out C 1, uh, C 2 is anyway we made 0 in order to avoid infinite uh, solution for the displacement. Now, since in the broken fiber we have fixed our coordinate here at the break that means, at x equal to 0 it cannot have stress because it is free there is no constraint. Therefore, at x equal to 0 the stress in the broken fiber is 0. When we put this we get that c 1 is equal to epsilon naught by beta, beta we have already defined. So, if we put this in equation number 6 we get the expressions for uh, sigma f again in terms of uh, x. Okay. Of course, there are other uh, like these are beta, epsilon or and e f are there. So, we can write this as e f into epsilon naught again is nothing but e f is the Young's modulus of the fiber, epsilon naught is the far field stress a strain. Therefore, this gives us the far field strain stress. Okay. So, we could express the stress in the broken fiber in terms of 
x and the far field stress. What is uh, suppose this is the broken fiber So, near the break there is redistribution of stress, okay. but far away from the break the stress is the applied stress epsilon naught okay. and how it varies this is given by this equation. Okay. So, you can clearly see that sigma f increases with increase in x okay. because as, as x increases this term decrease, decreases and therefore uh, sigma f increases. Okay. So, the variation is something like this if you plot it at x equal to 0 it is 0 and it keeps on increasing like this. Okay. Now, let us see uh, uh, if we put suppose if we the, the equation is sigma f is equal to uh, sigma f is equal to sigma naught sigma naught 1 minus e to the power minus beta x 1 minus e to the power minus beta x if sigma f reaches 95 percent of the far field stress which implies 1 minus minus beta x is equal to 0.95 which implies e to the power minus beta x equal to 0 0.05 this gives us uh, minus beta x is equal to minus 2.99 or we can write that beta x is equal to 3. That means for a value of beta x is equal to 3 the stress in the broken fiber sigma f reaches 95 percent of the far field stress sigma naught. Okay. What does it mean? Suppose this is sigma naught okay, and this is sigma f. this x at around beta x equal to 3 the x is such that beta x equal to 3 this is 0.95 sigma naught. Now, if we consider a carbon fiber with a polymer matrix and if we assume that the spacing h is equal to the radius of the fiber r f therefore, using the expression for beta we get that beta x equal to 3 implies beta is equal to 0.43 by d f. Therefore, x is equal to 7 times the diameter of the fiber. Now, the diameter of the carbon fiber is of the order of 10 to 15 microns and therefore, this tells us that x is equal to 98 into 10 to the power minus 6 meter that means 98 micron. That means, what we get from the this discussion is that if a fiber breaks a portion of the fiber of course, becomes ineffective that means, it cannot take part in the load bearing, but at a distance of say for, for this case of a carbon fiber in polymer matrix at a distance of 98 micron the fiber stress in the broken fiber is 95 percent that of the nominal stress that means, it starts taking part in the load bearing. Okay. So, this is what we actually, so we understand the role of the mat, role of matrix if we plot beta x versus sigma f. So, sigma f at this point is 0.95 of sigma naught at what point where beta x is equal to 3. Okay. Therefore, uh, the matrix actually helps the broken fiber to be ineffective only over a small length that means, the broken fiber is ineffective only over a small length and the remaining part 
actually takes part in the load bearing how by the by the uh, transfer of shear stresses by the matrix by the load transfer of the matrix that is how matrix plays an important role in the uh, tensile strength of fiber composites especially when the considering the statistical uh, distribution of the fiber strength if one fiber breaks that does not become completely ineffective and this is how the discrepancy in the tensile, uh, longitudinal tensile strength of the dry bundle of fibers and the uh, fibers impregnated in the matrix has been explained. Okay. Uh, next, uh, we will uh, see the compression failure of the fiber composites, longitudinal compression of fiber compos composite considering fiber microbuckling. Okay. There, uh, the compression strength as, as we have already seen that actually the compression longitudinal compression strength of fiber composite is much is less compared to its tensile strength okay and one of the reason is actually the fibers are slender and therefore even though the composite as a whole doesn't buckle there may be fiber micro buckling there have been lot of studies by many investigators and in uh, uh, rosen has given uh, a a uh, an explanation in terms of uh, understanding the compression strength considering fiber micro buckling and uh, he has actually associated the longitudinal compression strength with the micro buckling of fibers which leads to the failure. Uh, what has been uh, 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 considered is that the when the suppose you have a so I am again exciting suppose we consider these are the fibers and in between of course, there are matrix, these are the fibers. So, this is a part of a, I mean a larger component. So, locally what might happen is this fiber tends to buckle under the compression load, this fiber tends to buckle, okay. but this buckling is actually resisted by the matrix. That means, if you consider two adjacent fibers, Suppose this is the initial state, and under loading, I'm just exerting uh, the fibers might try to buckle like this. But when it tries to do this, the matrix actually experiences strain, and matrix tries to resist that buckling. So based on that, fiber micro buckling, the longitudinal compressive strength uh, uh, of the of the composites has been explained. Okay, in this, uh, the fibers are considered initially straight. He has assumed it was assumed that the fibers are initially straight. Straight fibers do not go by my diagram, it, it might not look straight, but the fibers are straight. Okay. And, uh, and subjected to compression. Okay. The fibers are idealized as slabs of thickness h and width as unity. In the width direction, this is unity. Okay, the fiber spacing is say twice c. Okay, the fiber spacing is twice c. Okay, and the fibers might buckle in extension and shear mode. That means, under this compression, there could be two ways the fibers could buckle. This is the extension mode. If you look at two adjacent fibers, they might go away from each other, which is the extension mode. The matrix actually experiences extension. This matrix in between experiences extension and in shear mode the two fibers might actually try to slide over each other and the matrix in between the matrix this is the matrix experiences shear and the matrix tries to resist that by its shear 
resistance in this case the matrix tries to re resist this by its uh, extent uh, I mean by means of by experiencing tensile strain by the ok. So, the matrix is in extension mode matrix experiences extensional strain in matrix shear strain in matrix ok. Therefore, the fibers could buckle in two distinct mode extension mode and shear mode ok. So, now considering the fiber buckling suppose considering the transverse displacement considering the transverse displacement of the fiber to be sinusoidal ok. That means, this is our x and this is y. So, the displacement along x is u, displacement along y is v and uh, uh, the displacement transverse displacement v is expressed as v is equal to a sin n pi l by x, n is the number of half wave. Okay. So, we can take the derivative that means, d v d x and second derivative this, uh, del d square v d x square and we get this terms. Okay. And uh, now, suppose there is a fiber which is initially straight, initially straight and subjected to axial compression. and say it deforms like this. Okay. So, this along x this is delta okay. again this is our x this is y. Okay. So, what is this delta? Suppose, this length is L after it buckles. So, what is the initial length? Initial length is given by this. If you consider this a small length of say d x and d y, then this is nothing but under root d x square plus d y square. Therefore, this is nothing but uh, under root 1 plus uh, d y d x square d x this is nothing but 1 plus v prime first derivative of v v is the y component of displacement. So, this is what it is. So, if we integrate this over the entire length 0 to l this is the length okay. M minus l is nothing but the delta therefore, the delta is the reflection along the x and once we integrate this uh, I mean we get these expressions and uh, uh, using we take the expression for v dash from 1 uh, from equation 2 and put it here and after integration we get this. Therefore, this is the work done. Work done is nothing but the force into the corresponding displacement therefore, the axial force is p and delta is the corresponding displacement therefore, this is the work done. Okay. Now, what happens uh, this work done is actually stored in the form of strain energy in the fiber and the matrix. Okay. The total work done is actually stored as a strain energy in the fiber as well as in the matrix. Now, first let us see that what is the strain energy stored in the fiber. Okay. Now, the strain energy stored in the fiber, fiber actually bends therefore, we can find out the strain energy of fiber using the bending energy and we know that the strain energy due to bending from the theory of pure bending we know if m is the moment and theta is the corresponding uh, angular displacement and from there we, we know we can derive this that uh, u is equal to uh, the strain energy could be expressed in terms of uh, half of bending stiffness E i into 
del square feet del x square. Okay. I think we have studied this in our theory of pure bending okay. that this is the strain energy uh, due to pure bending of a beam. So, similarly here uh, this, this is nothing but d square y d x square. Okay. So, here we can take this v double prime using v double prime from equation 3. Okay. So, this is what we get and we have considered the fiber to be idealized fiber was idealized as a slab of thickness h and unit unit width therefore the second moment is bh cube by 12 therefore 1 into h cube by 12 so we have used this here and we get the expressions for strain energy stored in the fiber due to bending okay so out of the total work done a part of this is stored as, as strain energy in the uh, fiber okay, be, because the bending of the fiber and a part of it is actually stored in the strain, uh, strain energy of the matrix as we have already discussed that the matrix be, depending upon the mode it could be extension mode in that case the matrix is entirely experiencing extensional shear strain uh, sorry extensional strain or it could be shear mode in that case the matrix will be experiencing shear strain. So, in extensional mode the matrix is under extension matrix under uh, undergoes uh, extensional strain and in shear mode the matrix uh, experiences shear strain. Okay. So, let us uh, uh, find out uh, one by one say suppose we want to find out the strain energy stored in the matrix in extension mode. Okay. So, Okay, this is our x axis, this is y axis and this distance is twice c. Okay. So, the strain along y is nothing but this is y component of displacement is v, x component is u. Therefore, the strain in the matrix along y is nothing but v at c minus v at minus c divided by this distance to ic okay, by the definition of strain. Okay. So, uh, we know that uh, v x at c is nothing but minus v x at minus c okay. and when you put this we get this as the strain in the matrix along y extensional strain in the matrix along y. Okay. Therefore, what is the strain energy stored? We know that the strain energy under extension is nothing but half into stress into strain into volume of course, okay. the volume integral. Okay. So, in this case it is, so this could be written as half into uh, using stress strain relationship, strain could be, stress could be written as e into epsilon therefore, this is half e epsilon square d v. Okay. So, this is the extensional strain half e m e m is the Young's modulus of the matrix u i is the extensional strain in the matrix and d v is the volume. So, in this case the volume is nothing but volume of matrix is twice c into d x small length okay, twice c into d x into width is 1 and integrating between 0 to l. Okay. So, this is the volume okay. and once we integrate this, this is the strain energy stored in the matrix purely because of extensional strain, okay. purely because of extensional strain this is the strain energy stored in the matrix. Uh, now, we have the work done from equation number 5 we have the strain energy stored in the fiber from equation number 6 strain energy stored in the matrix because of extension from equation number 9 when we equate this we get an expression for 
p okay and where beta is defined as this okay now what is n here n is equal to 1 means n is equal to 2 means it will buckle like this. So, n is equal to 3. So, we can now the minimum value of p at which it will buckle could be found out because it is a function of n taking the first derivative with respect to n and putting it to 0 and we get this condition the relationship between n and beta n square is equal to under root beta and when we put this when we put this in equation number 10 we get the expression for p as this okay we get the expression for p as this now we have considered this as the fiber two fibers adjacent fibers separated by matrix distance is twice c and this is h for unit width and for a given length the volume fraction of fiber is nothing but h by h plus 2 c length is same width is same therefore, this is the volume fraction. Okay. So, we get this h by 2 c in terms of volume fraction and when you put this in equation number 12 we get this is this as the expression for load at which micro buckling will take place the minimum load. Okay. So, p is the load. So, what is the compression stress? Compression stress is nothing but again for unit width p by area. So, h plus 2 c into area. So, we get this as the expression for the critical compression stress at which the fiber micro buckling will take place. Therefore, in a fiber composites this is the stress and you can clearly see this is a function of Young's modulus of the fiber, Young's modulus of the matrix and the volume fraction. Okay. This is because it is due to extensional mode. In the same way, we can also see what happens in the shear mode. Okay. So, in shear mode, in shear mode, I am just exaggerating the figure. If we consider two adjacent fibers, suppose this is one fiber. this is another fiber they are separated by a distance to ic okay so in shear the two fi adjacent fibers actually slide over each other therefore this point moves here and this point moves here one moves in the upward direction other moves in the downward direction now this is our x Okay. This is y, u is the displacement along x, v is the displacement along y. Therefore, what is this distance? This distance is nothing but this is h, okay. therefore this distance is nothing but h by 2 into the angle dv dx. Okay. This is nothing but u at c. Okay. Now, we assume that it is only subjected to shear. Okay. Now, using the strain displacement relationship, we know that the gamma x y is nothing but del u del y plus del v del x. Okay we know this from uh, elasticity and from 1 uh, I mean we already have the expressions for del v del x. So, uh, we have from 1 2 and uh, from 1 we have del v del x sorry from 2 we already have the expression for del v del x. So, this is del v del x and what is del u del y? Del u del y is nothing but the displacement at c and displacement at minus c divided by the distance initial distance to i c. Okay. So, we get del u del y as this when you put u c 
is equal to of course minus 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 u at minus c we get this as the expression and therefore we get del u del y as this and putting this in the expression for this shear strain we get an expression for the shear strain okay so once we put this expression for the shear strain in the strain energy stored because of pure shear we know that the strain energy stored because of shear half into shear strain into shear stress dv and using the stress strain relationship we know that this is uh, shear stress is nothing but uh, shear strain into shear modulus therefore we get this gm gamma m square where gamma m is nothing but this gamma xy the shear strain in the matrix just now we have calculated once we put this we get this as the expression for the strain energy stored in the matrix entirely because of the shear because in this case the matrix is experiencing shear and now again equating the work done equal to the strain energy in the fiber plus strain energy in the matrix because of shear and then putting those values here we get this as the expression for the critical load at which fiber microbuckling in shear mode will take place okay now because the fiber is slender its length is far higher compared to its thickness therefore we can take this as to be zero and once we put this in equation 23 we get the expression for critical buckling load at which the fiber microbuckling takes place in the shear mode okay therefore the critical compression stress at which microbuckling in the shear mode takes place is given by this p by area again we need you need width so h plus 2c into 1 so and expressing this h by h plus 2c in terms of uh, we know that this is nothing but the volume fraction okay just now we have done that vf is nothing but h by h plus 2c because h is the thickness of the fiber and 2c is the thickness of the matrix therefore h by h plus 2c for a given length and width is nothing but the representing the volume fraction okay so the critical compression stress at which fiber microbuckling in shear mode will takes place is given by this now you can clearly see here it is purely a function of the shear modulus of the matrix and of course the volume fraction that is the relative proportion of the fiber and the matrix because in this case we have only considered the shear of the matrix okay uh, now what will be the critical compression load considering extension and shear mode whichever is minimum is considered to be the critical compression stress at which fiber microbuckling will take place and uh, that is decide that that decides what is the longitudinal compression strength of a fiber composites okay now having done that even this uh, it is observed that actually overestimates whatever we get considering the fiber microbuckling it is overestimates the compression strength longitudinal compression overestimates the longitudinal compression strength it does not uh, agree well with the experiment experimentally it is observed that the strength what we get using this is much higher compared to the experimentally observed strength okay say for example in a typical say glass epoxy the experiment gives us anything around sorry anything around 600 to 1000 mega pascal as the longitudinal compression strength is from experiment from this uh, fiber micro microbuckling we get considering extension extension mode and 2200 considering 
shear mode. Okay. Therefore, they do not agree well rather they overestimate the reasons are the reasons are we considered a regular fiber spacing, but actually the fiber spacing are irregular that influences the strength. Then we considered perfect bonding, but there may be imperfection in fiber matrix bonding. Then we consider the fibers are all aligned, okay. So, but there may be fiber misalignment. There may be fiber misalignment. Then uh, there is Poisson's ratio mismatch that we have discussed earlier also. So, these are the reasons for uh, portions of the mismatch between the fiber and the matrix. So, these are the reasons due to wh which it does not uh, uh, correlate well with the experiments rather it overestimates. Okay. However, at least in this elasticity approach we understood that how the uh, fiber and matrix actually interacts and more importantly we understood the role of matrix in determining the both the tensile longitudinal tensile strength uh, as well as the longitudinal compression strength in a uh, in a fiber matrix composites okay thank you i'll stop here today